Praise God. Well, it is uh, great to be here. It's great to see our kids today. Why don't we dismiss our kids for BKI Kids at this time, and let's give our kids a big round of applause if we could. Let them know that we love them. Well, uh, today concludes our Missions Possible Week, and it's been a great week, and we have been challenged so greatly throughout this whole process. And uh, today we're going to be uh, blessed with the ministry of Mike Hattinger. Uh, we have partnered with the Hattingers, I think, for a long time, 23 years. And so that's, that's pretty great. And uh, with my being 39, I mean, we started <laughs> when I was just a wee lad. And so it's great. It's great to uh, be able to catch up and to have him here. And uh, we are uh, thrilled to have him today. We're going to kick things off with a video from uh, the ministry that they are a part of, and then uh, we'll be blessed with the ministry of, of Mike Hattinger. Right now, why don't we just clap for him and thank God for him, and then we'll play this video. Four million six hundred fifty-eight thousand two hundred and fifty-six decisions for Christ. Twenty-nine percent of credentialed and upgraded Assemblies of God ministers in the U.S. academically trained. Over one million people studying around the globe. More than fifty-four thousand churches and house churches planted. What connects these numbers is people, and they're all part of the story of what God is doing through Global University. Our mission is simple. Win the lost, train the found, and retain the harvest everywhere. No matter what country, language, or circumstance, GU provides sound biblical training to pastors, church planters, and believers around the world. From pastors in Cuba who earn only $25 per month, now receiving advanced training. Thousands of student workers in India planting house churches while they study. Dedicated learners sharing the gospel with majority and minority ethnic groups in Vietnam. Students training to minister to refugees across Europe. Ministers sharing hope to the displaced and needy in tumultuous Burma. Inmates in the U.S. discipling new believers. Equipping Chinese speakers around the world. And thousands of students risking their very lives building networks of trained believers throughout the Arab world and faithfully living out the Great Commission in these highly sensitive areas. Global University is passionate about reaching people and providing transformational ministry training. Be a part of the story of what God is doing through Global University. Good morning, Bethel Church. Like I told the church uh, <clears throat> last Sunday, I said, I show up every five years, so I'm, very, I'm a very regular attender. <laughs> and uh, some of the folks didn't get it, but uh, I think you got it. So it's been five years, and it was five years before that, and it was five years before that, and it was five years before that. And uh, I don't know why Phil always calls me to, uh, for the last service when it's time to raise faith pledges, but he just feels like I'm really good at that. And I wish he would quit picking on me, but he keeps doing this every fifth year. Before we begin, I'm going to ask Nicole, the, uh, the Energizer Rabbit pastor, to come up here. <laughs> come on up, Nicole. See? She even runs to the platform. <laughs> Nicole, you have been so kind and gracious in our communications uh, these last number of uh, months, really, now it's been. And you're always so prompt. Uh, you're answering emails. Uh, almost by the time I press send, there's a new email in my box. <laughs> she responds, which I think most of you aren't surprised, right? Uh, you see that energy. Uh, in fact, I told your husband when you came in, we put, if, there's one, if they put one more battery in you, you're just going to come. <laughs> I love that. It's true. But anyway, you know, my wife, one of her gifts, uh, she could not be with us today. But my, one of my wife's gifts is that she, made, she makes homemade cards that she paints. And uh, here is a pack of some of her best cards. And this is a gift just for you, you. to say thank you from thank you so us. Much. All right? 
Let's give Nicole Thank a you. round of applause. You. Yeah. You know, not every church has a, a, such a vibe like, like Bethel Church, and uh, really it's because the consistency of uh, your pastor and his wonderful family and the staff that he always just leads so graciously. This morning, I am going to tell you some secrets about missions that uh, you may not be aware of. And uh, you had a week ago, Craig uh, Corbin, he and his wife Liz, are pioneers. Uh, they are people at some point that might be writing, writing books. If they don't, it's because it's too dangerous to write books. But they are people who have uh, done things that only heaven uh, knows about. And then uh, they're wonderful people, just wonderful people. We've known them many years. And then Wednesday, you had Victoria, uh, a young lady going to a sensitive country, such a courageous young person willing to step out and in faith and to go to places where uh, that many, well, most of us uh, uh, know nothing about, but she's willing to go. And so I want, to, I want to speak to you this morning straight from the heart. And uh, we're going to conclude this time today before 1130 with your response. And have all of you received uh, this faith promise card? Can you hold it up if you've got it already? This is really important today. And, and I'm going to be very mindful of the time, but also be very sincere in my words. And I'm going to ask you to, to have this card and uh, to make sure you have a pen or a writing thing, because we're going to fill these out when we conclude today. This is so, so, so important in the influence this, this church has around the world. And um, I'm going to pray right now over uh, these few verses that I'm going to read uh, before I go into my remarks. Father, we desperately need the anointing of the Holy Spirit that our lips speak only those things which are necessary and that our hearts hear those things which are so necessary. Father, we pray for the response today in just a few minutes as we respond to what we will do by faith in participating in missions this coming year. And Father, I thank you for this church, many, many years of support, every month, never failing. God, what a blessing they have been to not only my family, but to missionaries across this wonderful state. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. In Acts chapter 13, uh, I am actually going to skip straight to verse number 2. That says, and while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and prayer, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. I'm going to share some things this morning that I have never shared in any church in my entire life. Um, is this being live streamed? It is. Um, okay, then. So is it. There was a young man who grew up in Summit County. This is Summit County, right? When he was 16 years old in high school, South Akron, um, he began that sensing that God was asking him to serve him full time with his life. And this young man, uh, really what was most important to him was uh, playing baseball and dating. Uh, and if those, you know, sports and girls aren't the most important thing in your life, uh, when you're a teenager, music might be a third. But at that point, uh, that was the focus of this young man's life. He loved Jesus. He'd gotten saved at a young age, was baptized in the Holy Ghost at 12 years old. He was thoroughly Pentecostal. But his interests really were sports, uh, 
girls work, having a little money, and driving an old Mazda. Um, but he obeyed God's call and he began taking Bible courses and he prepared for the ministry. And when he graduated uh, from high school, uh, he spent about four years doing that uh, and then became the youth pastor in a church in South, uh, southern Cuyahoga County in Cleveland. And he was there for six years uh, where he met his wife. They had their first child. And then uh, from there they moved to a little town called Vermilion, which is on Lake Area over by Cedar Point where they were there for six more years. And one uh, New Year's Eve, they had an Ohio missionary by the name of Isaac Smithia. Ring a bell? Anybody? And they had Isaac Smithia on a New Year's Eve service because uh, this young man who was now pastoring uh, this little church felt like, what a way to ring in the new year by bringing a missionary in. And Isaac came full of grace and graciousness and a few really bad jokes. And you can tell him I said that. And, uh, but he said some things that night that really struck the heart of this, now this young man and his young wife. And uh, by this time they had three small boys. And as they looked at their town of Vermilion and they saw that there were 11 evangelical churches in a town of about 20, less than 20,000 people. Uh, they recognized that there was a need to share and preach the gospel in other parts of the world where people didn't have an opportunity. And uh, I'm going to have to stay up here, aren't I? Because there's so many cameras. And if I stand right there, all they're going to see is a screen, I think. <laughs> Am I right? Or no? Or does it not matter? No okay. I can move around, all right. So this young uh, couple began seeking the Lord, and the young man um, had an opportunity to go on a missions trip um, to Russia. And he was in, in um, St. Petersburg, Russia in February. And if you know anything about geography, it's very, very cold in St. Petersburg, Russia. And this young man was sitting on a bus on an early morning uh, waiting for the other people in this mission trip. And he looked outside and he saw people waiting in a bread line uh, with their hats and coats and their little bread coupon. And uh, he remembered that he had under his seat a box of Bibles in Russian. So he took this box of books and he went outside and he began going down the bread line and passing out the Bible to these Russian people who were waiting in line. And when people towards the back began realizing what was being passed out, they left their place in line and they ran to the front begging for a Bible before this young man's box emptied out. And it was at that point that this young man recognized that there was such need around the world for people who didn't know the word of God that he simply said a, a, a small prayer that said, God, if you want me to serve you in places around the world where they don't have access to you and they don't know you, then, then I'll go. And the Lord heard that, and when this young man came back to his wife in his small church there in Vermilion, uh, he told his wife what, what um, had happened. And they agreed to wait just a couple of more years to make sure that that thing on the inside was, was real. And it was for them. And then finally, in, at the end of 1995, this young man and his wife, they resigned their church and they applied to become Assemblies of God missionaries. And I tell you this story because uh, sometimes there's a lot of questions and there's doubts on how does a young boy from Southern Summit County, South Akron, end up in the middle of nowhere in the deserts of Mexico, living among cartels, living amongst some of the most dangerous people in the world who would put a bullet through your head and cut your wife's 
throat and kidnap your kids in a heartbeat without even thinking about it. And what I want to tell you this morning is that it's not because that young man or Craig Corbin or Victoria or any other missionary that you've had are so brave and so special or so spiritual. It's, it's actually because some of the most broken people that I know are missionaries. Some of the most broken people that serve in countries and in dangerous places are missionaries. So it's not because they're special or because they have some sort of a, a gifting. It's because God somehow chooses to pick someone and say, I want you. And that's called a calling. And again, it's not because they're special Often it's because they're broken. And because they're so broken, they're they're willing to say yes to anything. And so after some 12 years working with the old colony, uh, German farmers in Northern Mexico, if you can believe such a thing, go to Google and just put in Mexico Mennonites and you'll see the evidence there. It were broken even farther because this young man now in Mexico in his um, mid-40s suffered a serious epileptic seizure in northern Mexico, in the middle of nowhere, ended up in a small clinic where they wanted to do brain surgery and remove the top of his skull just because they had never had a brain surgery in their clinic and they wanted to look inside. And God used a Mexican Jewish doctor to rescue this young man and evacuate him to El Paso, Texas where his wife and kids joined him later. And after a two and a half year recovery, making sure there were no tumors, the official diagnosis was epilepsy, general epilepsy across the brain. And that this young man, unless God divinely healed him, would be on epileptic medication for the rest of his life, which would slow his motor skills, his mental faculties, cause him to be tired and depressed unless he fought against it with every ounce of energy that he has. He was then asked to move this young man to southern Mexico and to team up with another younger couple uh, to begin pioneer work um, with the Zapoteco Indians. And the Chatino Indians and the Mixteco Indians in a land called Oaxaca that has 124 languages in one state. Unreached people groups that didn't speak Spanish in southern Mexico. Well, why was that so? Why was that not different? Because they had just left a place in northern Mexico where they didn't speak Spanish. They spoke Plotich, which is a combination of Dutch and Russian and German. And now they're in southern Mexico working in team with another young family. And now the work changes. Now it's in the mountains and it's driving through rainstorms and snowstorms and, and landslides. And, and, and again, broken people just trying to, trying to, trying to figure out what God's will is. Because there's nobody, there's not one of us who day to day to day have this sense that I always know what God's will and I hear vo- God's voice clearly. We always are trying to fine tune 
our ears, aren't we? Now the Bible says we know God. But the fact is that in the sense of do we really know God, the fact is we, the real great thing is that he knows us. <laughs> right? And we know about God as we discovered in Sunday school this morning. And, and that young man would say, I don't know God, but I do know that he loves me. And I do know that he knows my brokenness, and I do know he understands my weaknesses. So, so there in Oaxaca, Mexico, this, this couple is not so young anymore. Now they're in their mid-40s. And for some 12 years, they're living in this little Zapoteco Indian town called San Andres Huayapan. And, uh, and they pioneer works among the Zapoteco Indians, the Chatino Indians, uh, they do earthquake relief in a place where many, many poor people died in an earthquake in 2017, but it was never reported because nobody cared. But there was a ministry called Convoy of Hope, and they sent someone to southern Mexico. And this young man called the Convoy of Hope worker and he said, it's a miracle that you just called me because I was just driving into the mountains, said this Convoy of Hope worker. And once I lost my signal, I was headed to the airport and leaving because we have about, I better not put a number on it, but it was a six figure number to donate to earthquake victims but we can't find anyone to set it up. And if you're willing to meet me in the morning, we can work things out. And so this, this missionary man now, teamed with Convoy of Hope and with the National Church and Relief was given. And so we jump ahead. At the end of 12 years, uh, in southern Mexico, uh, this man's boss um, let me stop here. This young man and his wife, this man and his wife, they sensed that God was preparing them to do something different. And they sold their furniture and they came back. And God gave them a little phrase and it went something like this. I need a missionary with a pastor's heart. That was it. And based on that alone, they sold all their furniture and they left Mexico. They came back to the United States and attended missionary renewal meetings as is required by the Assemblies of God. And the regional director of Latin America walks up to this man and says, uh, there's going to be a position open in Central America and I can't tell you where it is or when it's going to happen, but I'm looking for a missionary with a pastor's heart. Would you pray about it? And the missionary said through a smile, sure. It didn't take him long to figure that one out. And so for the next five years, this man now in his uh, mid to late 50s, he and his wife uh, moved to Costa Rica and led the language school because all the new missionaries from the United States the Assemblies of God who go to Latin America have to go to this language school for a year and to figure life out and to learn Spanish. And so for five years, this is what they did. And after five years, uh, they were told that their services were greatly appreciated. And But as the people before them served five years and the people before them served five years that they were told that their service had come to an end. And so now this man, now in his early 60s, and his wife are saying, Lord, what's next? Now, I just read for you a scripture and I'm, I'm going to finish this in about five minutes and then we're going to go to those cards if you look at this scripture, it says two things. 
It says that the church was worshiping and fasting, and then God spoke. I'm so glad that God speaks to churches. Aren't you? Do you want to be a part of a church where God isn't speaking? Wouldn't be much of a church, would it? And so, while they were worshiping, God spoke. Doesn't tell us how. Doesn't tell us how. But he simply said, I want you to pick uh, these two men over there, and they're going to be my missionaries. And the Bible says that they prayed about it, the two men accepted the challenge, and the Bible says that the church laid their hands on them. It doesn't mean they threw them out, it means that they sent them out, right? <laughs> Big difference. And they became the two first missionaries in the New Testament. Then the next verse says something interesting. And it says, and being sent out by the Holy Spirit. Well, that's kind of odd. I thought it said the church sent them out. Well, that's true too. But what it really means is that missionaries have two things that happened. Number one, they... They feel on the inside that the Holy Spirit is telling them, I'm calling you to be my servant in another part of the world. And often that happens at about 16, 17, 18, maybe 20, 22. And it happens to, to young people who are often broken. They're broken. You know what I mean by, do you know what I mean by broken? You know, you're looking at me like, oh no, I, Broken is like people who knew that if people who know that if their secrets were broadcast to the world, they would be really embarrassed. That's a broken person. But that person in all of his hurts, hang-ups, and habits falls at the feet of Jesus and says, God, if you can do anything with my broken life, I'm willing to be used. That's what brokenness is. Brokenness is not, I grew up in the church and I have all these degrees and I am this smart and God, you should be really proud to have me say to you. That's not brokenness. Brokenness simply says that if the world knew my, my hang-ups and my habits and my hurts, they would not like me and they would reject me and they wouldn't, I wouldn't be accepted. That's a broken person. And when that person falls at the feet of Jesus and says, I'll do anything because I'm so thankful that you accept me, I think, I think Jesus says, perfect. So if you're a young person here today or you're a young couple and you have hurts, habits, and hang-ups in your life that you're not proud of, you're a prime candidate to be a missionary. And that's what God did for this young man from Southern Summit County, and that's what God is still doing today. So you have this card in front of you. Unfortunately, we have we have some challenges, and that is that there are young people and young couples, and I shouldn't just limit that to young because the greatest missionary that Mexico ever had, he didn't start till he was 65. He was a good friend of mine, and he built more churches and built more orphanages between 65 and 75 than anyone has ever done in Mexico. He didn't start till he was 65. So there's no age limit. But you see, there are people who feel called. They don't know where to start. And they're willing if they just need a little bit of encouragement. And that's why you have young people like Victoria Ross who came on Wednesday. She needs encouragement. She can't go by herself. So when it says that the church sent them out, do you really think that the church just led those two guys to the door and say, have a good trip? 
I mean, is that really how it works? You and I wouldn't take a vacation if we didn't have the money. Oh, we shouldn't, but we wouldn't. Let alone spend four years or a lifetime living in the middle of nowhere preaching the gospel. I mean, they, they, they need money. I mean, how are they going to get there? How are they going to live? Victoria, uh, Victoria can't, can't work while she's there. And you wouldn't want her to work. You'd want her to give her full time to the gospel. Am I right? Sure. And so you have this card in front of you. And what we are asking this morning is that you have this card and you simply make a decision on how much can you give to sending people like Victoria. How much can you give every month? Now those of you that are already giving, do this please as well. It just helps the church know how to administrate the monies. But take this card, and, and I want you to begin thinking of, of an amount right now while I'm closing. Because in order for missionaries to go and obey what's on the inside, they have to have churches that send. I mean, that, that's how it works. And so I'm asking that every person this morning, from the youngest to the oldest, this might be odd to you, but it's okay. It's not, it's safe. All right? And your name isn't going to be sold to a mailing list. All right? But what this says is, you know, Brother Mike, um, I think I can give this much every week, $5, $2, $10, or I can give this much every month you know, 20, 20, whatever. But you do this and kind of be a little bit on the edge. You know, we're not just talking about uh, Dunkin' Donut money. We're talking about, you know, do something that, that you can do and then put your name and sign it on there. And then, and then when you finish it, write it in this other little piece here and this you take home. And then this we're going to drop in the offering plate right now. Okay. It's, it's just that simple. You say, what, what happens if I die? If you die, you don't have to give. <laughs> All right. Okay, you don't, you're free. You're free, just like we sang. You're free indeed. All right? You're free. But this is only for one year. Twelve months. Just put, get a number. All right? And uh, let's just pray right now and ask the Lord to speak to us. Father, we need your help because uh, there are missionaries, new ones who want to go, but they need help going. And Lord, there are some older ones who have been faithful and they need help staying. And so we, we ask you right now, Lord, give us a number. Give us right now, Lord, just an amount. Show us. And Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, to be faithful in this, we pray. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Could you show your appreciation to Brother Mike?